This is The Top, where I interview entrepreneurs who are number one or number two in their industry in terms of revenue or customer base. You'll learn how much revenue they're making, what their marketing funnel looks like, and how many customers they have. I'm now at $20,000 per talk. Five and six million. He is hell-bent on global domination. We just broke our 100,000 unit soul mark. And I'm your host, Nathan Latka. This is episode 684. Coming up tomorrow morning, we talk to Jay Jumper. I love this story. He was using a product so much, paying for it, he ended up just buying the whole business. The company is called Signix. It's a document signing company. Good morning, everybody. My guest this morning is Nico Skivaski. He is the co-founder of Redox, the modern API for healthcare. He also used to do some work at Epic. We'll dive into both of those now. Nico, are you ready to take us to the top? Yeah, totally. All right. So start us off first. Uh, what is Redox and what's the business model? Yeah, so Redox connects applications, so software developers, with health systems. Um, our business model is essentially to license connections to various health systems. So if a software developer is selling an application to five health systems, we charge them five licenses to share data with those health systems on the other side. You must have the patience of mother freaking Teresa to deal with healthcare. Why on earth do you get into this market? Uh, the, the warm and fuzzy answer is that it's important, right? Um, you know, all, as entrepreneurs, we all say we're out there trying to change the world. But the cool thing for us is every day we get to talk to entrepreneurs, software developers who are building technologies that will actually impact patients' lives, make healthcare more efficient, uh, make care more effective for patients out there. So uh, at the end of the day, that's what, what it's really about. From our perspective, we really see technology innovation in healthcare as something that's absolutely needed. So our technology, this API layer that enables the use of this data, is a real core piece of that infrastructure. Um, so that's that's why we do it. It's um, you know you you joke about it being um, taking a while in the healthcare space, and that's totally true. But um, someone's got to do it, right? We've got to see the innovation come from technology in the space. And so um, we're going to see that over the next few years as health systems adopt more and more technology. And how do you make money? Yeah, so we, we charge the software developers. The software developers charge the health system. So we try not to get in the way. In, you know, We are a middleman in between health systems and software developers, but we try not to throw another contract into the sales cycle with health systems. Um, that is a, a unnecessary piece of friction that we try to avoid. So we become essentially a subcontractor to the software vendors, another part of their technical stack. You know, they might be paying Amazon for hosting and then they um, will add on Redox for that API layer to get to health systems. It's kind of part of that infrastructure that a developer thinks about when they're building out their technology. And is this a pay as you go model or it's a monthly fee for a certain amount of API calls or what? Yeah, so we, we thought about doing the... Um, number of API call model, but the sad reality of, of the healthcare data space is that um, it's often a fire hose. The health system will send hundreds of thousands of messages for every patient in its organization. And, you know, we can apply filters, but it's not often up to the application developer on the types of data that they're getting or the amount of data. So what instead we do is charge for the number of connections that they have to the various health systems. Um, and, and, and it is a monthly model. So if you're connecting to one health system, then it's one licensing fee, and it increments from there based on the number of health systems you're connecting to. It does scale a little bit depending on the type of data. So if you just need to know what patients are where in the health system, that's one type of data. But if you also need to know, you know the medication list for every type of patient, um, then that's another sort of data feed. So um, depending on the interface, it scales a little bit. And is, so, I mean, is this a SaaS model then? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So we don't charge for um, statement of works or upfront uh, implementation fees or anything like that. It's it's all SaaS. And they pay again based off kind of per connection. So what's the average kind of software vendor or data provider or, or software developer paying you per month? Uh, a, a couple grand. So most people are uh, connecting up to one or two or three health systems. Each health system connection is around a thousand dollars. So. Um, got that average of two, three grand per per customer. And what is the what's the backstory here? What you, what year did you found the company in? We founded it in 2014. Okay, and was this like right out of college for you? I mean, where were you in your life at this point? Yeah, so I had been working in the in the corporate world for about seven years. I did uh, four years at Wells Fargo um, as an operations analyst, and then went to grad school, and then went to work at Epic, so the big electronic medical record company. Um, I actually went to Epic to to 
get my hands on the data. I went to school for economics, so I wanted to try to understand, you know, what we could do to use data to make healthcare better, right? Um, the amount of data that's stored in electronic medical records has a ton of potential to identify, you know, trends in the data, things that, that we might be able to intervene on from a behaviors aspect. Um, and when I got to Epic, I realized that they actually don't have the data. They, um, the data is kept in the basements of, you know, in data centers that health systems manage all around the country. So, you know, while I was there, I really learned a lot about how Epic does a lot for the provider workflow and how electronic medical records do a lot to help providers become more efficient. But one of the challenges is, is, you know, now that healthcare is digitized, how do we get that data out of the basement into the cloud where software developers, modern app developers can use that to become more efficient? And that's, you know, a lot of where the idea behind Redox came from. Um, my, my CTO and co-founder, James, he, uh, um, was helping startups as a consultant hook up to various health systems and basically doing the same project over and over again and realize why don't we you know build an engine to to put this together um, so that's that's where the idea came from is let's uh, let's do this in a scalable way let's make a, an engine that can scale across multiple health systems basically any health system any electronic medical record we plug into it and standardize the the data so developers don't have to take on that task. And did you throw your own money at this as you built it or did you decide to go out and raise capital? Yeah, well, we did a little bit of both, which I think typically happens, right? We, um, the first, the first, it was probably two years after leaving Epic where James and I were working together, but not really understanding what to do with our hands. Um, we, we started a whole bunch of different companies really on a, on a, you know, in hindsight, it was really about discovering Redox. We started a co-working space we started, uh, we helped to start many uh, health tech companies in the Madison area and eventually found ourselves um, with the utter realization that Redox was the thing we needed to sink our teeth into. We brought on our third co-founder um, to really round out the company, Luke. And for the first year of working on this, we, we, we basically, we made no money. We, um, we, we this worked 2014? out. Yeah, this is 2014. We worked out of that co-working space that I mentioned we started. So we had very like next to, next to free office space. And um, put our heads together, ran, lived, the comp lived off of savings and side projects and consulting gigs until we formed around this idea of building the scalable um, interface engine in the cloud. Um, we raised a small seed round then. So oh, nice. the very, uh, yeah, uh, 350 grand at the end of 2014. Um, that allowed us to hire our first couple developers. So we all paid ourselves uh, basically the minimum we all needed to survive on for that next year. Which was what? Uh, it was a, so we literally came together and said, okay, everyone take your bills out and let's figure out, you know, what we need to survive. And we were all very transparent with each other. So I think it was around 35 K um, per person. And um, so we, and we all paid each other the same because we oh, said, three, was, you're talking about the three founders, about three grand per month. Uh, yeah. The three founders and um, the, we, we hired pretty much three people in the next couple months. So our, this group of six, we all paid ourselves exactly the same 35 grand. Um, and, you know, it was a huge sacrifice for all of us because um, at the time, everyone in the company had worked at Epic. Epic, you know, big tech company pays very well market salaries, um, you know, very well in comparison. We're for, talking like 200, 150. Yeah, yeah. You know, that ballpark. So this was a huge sacrifice for everyone. Everyone had to convince their um, significant others that this was a good idea. That's always uh, the hardest part. <laughs> How did yours respond? Are you are you with somebody? Yeah, yeah. My my wife, um, she worked at Epic also. She um, joined a startup after she left Epic. And so she she understood here. Um, she That's understood double the, risk. You're both in a startup. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so so she, she she understood, you know, the why we were doing this. And, you know, the at the end of the day, the sort of convincing that I had to do was, hey, if this fails, if it's, this doesn't work, you know, we have about a year runway on this, this 35 grand. Um, well, on this 350 grand that we raised. Um, if it doesn't work out, like worst case scenario is I'll get a job. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of cool thing for entrepreneurs is literally worst case scenario, you can go get a job. And typically uh, entrepreneurs, you know, we have background in some specialized skill set. We can go get jobs in, in different areas. Um, I could go work in, in healthcare at a health system or with another health tech company. Um, so that was my fallback plan was, uh, you know, I'll get a job. No big deal. And Nico, <laughs> fast forward us. So, I mean, have you raised in total the 350 or have you raised more? No, we, we've raised a couple rounds since then. So it took us about a year from end of November to um, about October of 2015 to get live at our first site. 
So we got an application that um, it's an iPad app that measures blood loss in the operating room. So they take pictures of anything that gets bloody and it measures how much blood loss a patient's had, which is mind blowing to me. Um, we, we integrated that application with uh, Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey. So any, um, it's actually any C-section. So when, when babies are being born via C-section, all the blood loss numbers get transferred from this app through Redox into their electronic medical record. Um, that was our first go live. It took us, you know, 10, 11 months to get live with our first customer after raising that first round. Um, that, that also coincided with us raising our, our Series A. So I think we raised our A pretty early, but the problem we were setting out to solve was big enough that the traction of having one live customer and also having lots of applications, uh, the developers who are really excited about it, the developer community who um, were you know, rallying behind us allowed us to raise, a, we raised a 3.5 million Series A, um, brought in some Boston investors who, who we really like, they're still on the team. Um, and that was at end of 2015. So, um, from then, we, we really started raising Nico, real our, quick, what were yeah. you at in terms of revenue at that point when you raised the 3.5? Well, we had that one live customer. So we were at about, you know, $1,000 or so, $2,000 a month in, um, you know, MRR. And so was, that, was that a convertible note or a priced round? It was a priced round. So how did you, you approach the equity? I mean, the valuation conversation with so little revenue, but clearly a big opportunity. Yeah, so I, I feel like when you're raising... You can either raise based on your traction, so so how much how much money are you making on a day to day basis, and you know some revenue multiplier. Um, so you can either raise based on your traction, or you can raise based on your potential, the the sort of exciting, goosebump inspiring things that's in your business model. And for us, this raise was all about potential. It Give was, me the goosebumps. What would what the pitch sound like? <laughs> the, the the pitch was sell me, baby. <laughs> there are a ton of innovations happening in healthcare, right? There, d digital health is one of the, the fastest growing places for venture capital because there's so many companies out there trying to start something innovative in the healthcare space. But the common problem they have is sharing data with the legacy systems at, at hospitals and clinics around the country. Redox opens that problem up. We enable all these applications, who you know, some of which will inevitably go under, but many will actually be adopted by health systems. We are essentially selling pickaxes, right, to the people who are out there Fighting, trying to um, trying to innovate in the space, and that's a that's a big grand vision. We had a really great team. We have a really great team to do that with a tremendous background in the in the space that comes from the leading electronic medical record in the industry. So that's all the big warm fuzzy. And by the way, we've done it once already. Like yeah. it's it's up and running and working. And that's the potential that we're selling. So it wasn't about the you know couple of grand we were making a month. It was about this potential of working with the army of software developers who are innovating in the space. Um, beyond, beyond just the one live customer, we had probably a couple hundred developers who had signed up and, and basically made applications on top of our APIs. So they're hooking into Redox and trying to sell their products into health systems. So our go-to-market strategy was all about getting the developers first and then the developers drag us into the health systems as they sell their products. And that was a pretty unique go-to-market strategy as well that investors got excited about. Nico, we're running short here on time, so just a few quick questions here. Um, that valuation, more or less than ten million post money. Um, it was right. It was a little less. A little less. Okay. Um, so you sold about thirty yeah. percent of the business. Yep. yep. Okay. And, and is that all? Um, is that all the you capital know, you've raised to date, or have you raised additional capital? What What are you all in? How much total raised? Yeah. So so fast forward um, to January, we closed a another nine million Series B round. Um, and then literally today, I'm doing press pitches to announce another million from a strategic investor that uh, we're announcing on Thursday. But that, that was money in the bank a couple of weeks ago. So um, all in, we're at $14 million, uh, that we raised so far. That's great. And this episode won't go live for many, many months. Who is that other additional investor? <laughs> so we, we raised money from Intermountain okay. Health System. They're a big regional player, cover basically all of Utah going up into Idaho. Um, and... The thing that we love about them is they're a huge innovator in the IT space. They built their own electronic medical record back in the day when these things were being invented. They've always been an innovator. And from our perspective, it's true validation from the health system side of our market. Yep. We've traditionally it's sold to the app developers. Now it's the health and system side. Of Nico, you said you were $14 million all in? Yep. Okay. And what are you at now in terms of developers using you? How many paying customers do you have? So we're in about 100 health systems across the country. And what does that mean, though? Because you told me you price based off developers and their how many yeah. connections. Yep. So, so these these health systems that are using us, they'll have between one and four or so applications that they'll be running uh, through Redox. So, you know, on average, I'd say 
two or so applications per health system. So that's like 200 or so uh, applications that are live and integrated through our platform. So is that 200 um, developers paying you then? Is that how I understand that? Yeah, yeah, okay. 200 application software. So these are like startups, right? So there could be a team of developers making an application, telemedicine app or a, a remote patient monitoring app or patient engagement application. Got it. And you said of those 200 developers, they on average will have maybe one, two or three kind of data connections. So if, right? So if I, can I, I mean, can I take 200 times 2000 to basically back into your, a range of your monthly recurring revenue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Uh, about 400,000. Yeah. yeah. That'd be a nice back of the napkin way that's, of doing it. I mean, that's uh, healthy though, right? So yeah. you're doing about 400,000 bucks a monthly recurring revenue, 200 developers building these things. You're in about a hundred different kind of hospitals that have adopted you $14 million raised. That's a, that's a good thing. That's why you look so young, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, from, from our perspective now, it's really just about how do we how do we crank that? How do we get into more health systems faster and um, really, really allow health systems to adopt innovation um, at a faster clip? Any churn, any developers that have started paying you and then had, uh, had to leave? What's your gross customer churn monthly? We've lost two. Um, not, and, not a lot. Yeah. And, and actually, it was so, so the number that we care about is number of live connections between developers and health systems. And we've lost two on that. And it, in both cases, it was because the health system was running a pilot with that application and they decided not to extend the pilot. How many so, of those total are there? 200? Uh, yeah, yeah. Got it. That's great. And what are you paying to acquire a customer? That's something that, that we're probably not as sophisticated as we should be on. Um, we have a, a pretty pure inbound strategy. So we put out a lot of content. We talk a lot about how we hope the world works from an integration standpoint, and we let people come to us. Um, but we haven't really done the math of, you know, how many hours are we spending, you know, from a content marketing perspective and a customer onboarding perspective uh, to figure out what that customer acquisition cost really is. So a lot of times when people have raised the amount of capital you've raised, it's for two reasons, either headcount or marketing spend. It sounds like yours maybe is going more towards headcount. What's your team Absolutely. size? We're at about 35 now. Oh, that's why. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's mostly developers. Um, we've got a big engine. We process a lot of very sensitive data, right? So this is, this is clinical patient data that's going through our engine. So a lot on the DevOps and performance side. Um, and we're a developer platform. So documentation and um, things like that to support the engine are, are really critical. So 35 all based in Wisconsin? Most of us. Um, I'd say two thirds are in Wisconsin. We have a, a a workforce that, you know, people can live wherever they want. Um, but most of us choose to live here because we actually like Madison. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Surprising to a lot of people. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we really love it here. But we have developers in um, basically coast to coast now. Um, we have a small office in Portland with uh, two people in it. We have a, a small group of three in Austin. So they're looking to get an office. We have a couple people in Chicago um, and they're going to open up a tiny office there too. So um, but yeah, everyone's really comfortable working remotely, you know, hopping on video calls and, uh, you know, doing video standups and things like that. If Amgen or Pfizer offers you 40 or 50 million bucks for the company today, do you sell? No. <laughs> from, from our perspective, well, well, and particularly because of those types of, you know, these are pharmaceutical companies. I don't think they're well suited to solve the problem we're trying to solve. We, we did have an acquisition offer really early in our, in our company. And the reason why we decided not to do it was because we didn't think that the company that was acquiring us was going to um, be able to solve the problem as fast as we were. Why'd they want it? They, they wanted it to add it to their, their product. So they, had a, they have a really great product that um, needs to integrate with health systems, and it would have been something to add to that to make them go faster. Were they from um, the healthcare space, or was it more developer-focused yeah. and tech space? Yeah, it was from the healthcare space. Um, and I think that's, you know... At the end of the day, if, if we were to get acquired, it would be because we believe that the acquiring company would be able to do this faster and better than we could on our own. Yep. Um, so it, it, we're a little principled behind that. But um, yeah. Many of you know I am buying companies that I really, really like. And there's no quicker way for me to get to the bottom of what is happening on that website than using this tool called nathanmaka.com forward slash hot jar, H-O-T-J-A-R. It basically will give me a recording, okay? When anybody lands on the website, it'll give me a recording of where the viewer is scrolling and obviously does the basic stuff like heat maps too, but I learn so much about where the users are scrolling and clicking on my site using that tool. It helps me increase conversion rates, make more money, and grow those businesses faster. And we'll have to see what happens with those businesses, but I'm buying 
buying them. I'm buying them very quick. And I'm using NathanLacka.com forward slash hot jar for all of my website analytics. You can too. I work with them. It's totally free. You can go to NathanLatka.com forward slash hot jar. No credit card required. Again, use it as much as you want. NathanLatka.com forward slash hot jar. I'll see you there. That's good. Hey, Nico, it makes perfect sense, man. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. You ready? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what this famous five like, is. I have no idea what these are. They're easier than everything I've asked so far. Okay, how about that? Okay. All right, number one, what's your favorite business book? Oh, man. Um, the, the one I think about the most, way back in, like, years ago, I read a book called, um, uh, oh, shit, I forget the name, Moments of Magic. It's like an 80s business book about a Scandinavian airline. Like, yeah. totally not a, not a cool one at all. But it was, it was just about customer service, and that really stuck to me, like, never letting customer down, going above and beyond. Um, and I think it's just very easy fundamentals of, of making customers happy. Number two, is there a CEO you're following or studying? So uh, honestly, and it's cliche in the healthcare space, but um, my old boss at Epic, Judy Faulkner, she's, um, she's a self-made billionaire, a private company, has 10,000 employees. And I just really respect the work that she's done to grow the company and stay true to the mission of uh, making healthcare a better place. So we, we love um, that we were able to learn from her for so long, but also just um, as, a, as a founder, she's a, an elusive creature. Epic is your $100 million exit, isn't it? <laughs> Epic doesn't acquire companies. So, really, it's part of their principle. Yep, it's one of their core principles. Interesting. All right, number, uh, number four, is there a favorite on, or number three, is there a favorite online tool you have, like Acuity Scheduling? <laughs> I, I love Calendly, so the <laughs> scheduling apps I think are huge, right? Yeah. Calendly is one of my favorites. Number uh, four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? Six. I have a baby. Oh, nice. Uh, one, just yeah. one little one or more? Yeah, just one. How old? Uh, he, he's 10 months. So, wow. yeah, he goes to bed around 7. I work from like 8 or so until midnight, and then he wakes up at 6. So, um, yeah, he, he, sleeps, he sleeps pretty good for a baby. But, um, yeah, I wake up with him around 6. And six. So, I assume you're married then? Yep. And, yep. and how old are you? I am 30. All right, last, last question, Nico. Take us back 10 years. What do you wish your 20-year-old self knew? <laughs> I didn't know about entrepreneurship. I thought I was going to be an economist. So I went to school. I went to grad school for it, thinking that I could be an economist and, you know, analyze things all my life. Um, and it's just not work that's cut out for me. I didn't even know or think about starting a company. Um, and I think if I was 20 years old and I told myself that, you know, maybe I would have started a company sooner. But then again, maybe I wouldn't be where I am now. So um, it's kind of a hard question. But I, I think I would have uh, gone back and said, hey, have you ever thought about starting something rather than, you know, working at a big bank? There you guys have it from Nico. He wishes that entrepreneurship was even an option back 10 years ago when he was 20 years old. Meanwhile, 2014 launched his company Redox. It is the healthcare API. Got a lot of success early on. They're now 35 uh, people. They've raised about $14 million. Over 200 applications inside over 100 different hospitals from these developers that are building applications using their API to give value, again, to clients uh, and healthcare uh, uh, providers. $2,000 ARPU on average per month, so doing somewhere around 400 grand a monthly recurring revenue. Only two people have churned. It's almost no churn and almost all inbound growth to date. Again, Tiva 35 based in Wisconsin. Nico, thank you for taking us to the top. Thanks. Have a good one. If you enjoyed Nico today, go back and listen to Felix yesterday. He's one of four PhDs who chose entrepreneurship over some big time job, and they raised 75 million bucks as a result of their data indexing idea called Colibra. It would mean the world to me if you guys got any value from this episode, if you would go leave a review on iTunes right now and then subscribe. You know, I hustle like heck to get these episodes out every freaking day for you guys, and trust me, I love it. I would do it with no listeners, but boy, oh boy. It makes my day and it makes my team's day when we see great reviews and get your feedback. So thanks so much. Okay, Top Tribe, I love giving away free money. I feel like Oprah giving away cars and I have something special for you today. How many of you have heard our super sharp guests talk about success they've had with Facebook and Google Ads? Well, all of you listening right now, yes, if you're listening, you get $100 in free AdWords. Here's how you get it. Okay, Again, thanks for listening. Get the free $100 from Google right when you sign up with my website host provider, HostGator. Go sign up now to get your free money. HostGator.com forward slash Nathan. Again, that's HostGator.com forward slash Nathan.